As I start out my teaching, I want to mention that this is something that is not solely from yours truly. This is something that I give a lot of compliments to fellow Bible-believing preachers and teachers who are more apt and equipped and whom the Lord can use better. So learning from them in all humility, not thinking that I'm the one that knows it all, if you have that kind of a mindset, then by studying what they lay down, then the doctrine can become more advanced, more clarified, and right. even appear new. Amen. Now, this is not really new, but it will appear very new. I'm going to be using new wording, so to speak. Yeah. And then when we turn to the scripture, it's going to look new, even though these are old scriptures that you read through before. But how many have done that with their Bible studies and Bible reading? Yes. Going through the same old verses, but it came out a new way that you didn't think about yeah. before. This teaching will solve the problem that is debated among academia, theologians, and churches worldwide. Now, we start out with the very basic. The very basic is that Christians agree that when the apostles were writing out verses, Old Testament verses, that they were verses fulfilling or foretelling about the Messiah, right? However, if you're going to be very honest as an academic scholar and read those verses that the apostles used, it looked like they are misquoting those verses. Because when you look at those verses, those verses seem to talk about the nation of Israel or to talk about the psalmist David, not Jesus himself. So a lot of rabbis and Jewish scholars, they debate against Christian scholars and say those verses that New Testament writers have used, uh, those Old Testament verses that the New Testament writers use to say, hey, this verse is talking about Jesus the Messiah, and when you look at it by context, it honestly does not look like that, okay? That's one. Number two, here's the second issue. A second issue is the general epistles. When you look at the general epistles, they are the book of Hebrews through Jude. Now, we've looked at our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study in Hebrews, and if any of you have watched that, you've seen how I put a double application in there. In other words, the book of Hebrews and the general epistles. They are books written to both tribulation Jews and Christian churches. That does not make absolute sense if we're going to be honest. And that's the same type of skepticism that Jewish rabbis have. If you were to read it by context and common sense, you know, it doesn't make sense that those Old Testament verses in the New Testament were talking about Jesus the Messiah. It looked like they were being misquoted. Bible-believing dispensationalists who say that general epistles are double application seem to be misquoting them, seem to be misapplying. Here's one that's for tribulation. Here's one for church age. That doesn't make sense if we're going to be honest. Why? Because when the person, the author, is writing the epistle, giving it to his readers, you think those readers, when they receive it, they're like, okay, I know that this is tribulation and then this is church. No, it seems like one, it just seems simply that the author is writing to them. Yes. <laughs> it's just that simple. So these are the type of complications that exist in the Bible. But they can be justified. Right. And the reason why they can be justified is because that kind of rationality that people use, and we'll cover it in our next teaching, but that is known uh, as a historical context. All right? Simply going by common sense, the people during those past ages, they were writing to people during those time periods. All right? It's just that simple, historically. But how we get around this, but the more accurate wording is not getting around it. The more accurate answer is the, the key to resolve this, the real true proper interpretation, is not to historically interpret the passages, but to spiritually interpret the passages. What does that mean? Those verses 
you can't just look at it at their historical time plane and the historical audience that the authors are writing to. You have to look at those verses spiritually. Spiritually meaning that from God, the Holy Spirit's perspective, because God is a spirit. And when he's quoting these verses, when he has those authors writing it down, what is God seeing in those verses? It may not be those people that the author is writing to then. Maybe God's seeing that as, no, I see my son, Jesus, the Messiah here, when you're writing that. God could be saying, no, I don't see that as those people during the first centuries, those Christian churches, when 1 John is being written, I see that verse as years later, 2,000 years later to the tribulation, where they will have to do that. See that? Now, that's a very interesting theory. And I'm going to say theory for now. All right? But later on, it will be doctrine. This is not theory. This will be doctrine. Not just doctrine, but in this lesson, I'm going to give you scriptural evidences. This is doctrine. That's right. Then the next time, I'm going to give you the academic. And then after that, the theological. And then I'm going to convince you once and for all that this is the right tool. All right? You want me to begin? Okay. Let me give one more. Let me give one more introduction here. One more introduction. We know that the Bible has a triple application method. Do any of you know what they are? Go ahead and call it out if you know what they are. What is the triple application method? All right, so one is historical. Can anyone call out number two? Spiritual. Spiritual, that's right. So I'll put that as number three, all right? That way we can make it very special, okay? <laughs> and then what's the number two? Doctrinal, okay. Now, uh, don't be shy, and there's, uh, if, if your answer's wrong, you're wrong, all right? So don't be embarrassed to <laughs> embarrass yourself. But to you, as a Bible believer, what is the most important one that you would think? Doctrinal, right? Uh, that's a natural tendency for Bible believers. Would we all agree with that one? So uh, if not all of you, most of us would agree that the most important application is doctrinal. That's what we Bible believers use. Now, what is the least important to us Bible believers? You ever thought about that? <laughs> Historical? Actually, it's spiritual, believe it or not. So it's spiritual. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. The reason why spiritual is the least, uh, the least thought upon is because many cults use the spiritual application. So for example, if you look at Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7 talks about the 12 tribes of Israel that God will use in the tribulation. Now we believe that that is a real thing that will literally and doctrinally happen. We know doctrinally that this is referring to 12 tribes of Israel. We know that this is literally referring to literal Jews. So historically as a nation of Israel will be uh, in action at Revelation 7 during the tribulation. We know that, okay? Bible believers, the first rule, that we always do when we read the Bible. The first thing that we do when we read the Bible is literal, right? We always take the Bible literally as it says. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What does that mean? It means what it says. It's just as simple. Sometime at the beginning, all right, no, in the beginning, there was no time. God created everything. But you get philosophers, theologians, people like William Lane Craig, who are brilliant intellectuals, that can give the most ridiculous interpretations because they spiritualize verses. So when they look at Genesis 1-1, they see it as, oh no, it's evolution that created the whole world. Where'd you get that from? No, read it as it says. Intelligent design. God created it himself. Boom, like that. Why can't you just believe it like that? So scholars tend to allegorize, make the verses metaphorical. They spiritualize the verses. 
Jehovah's Witnesses, when they look at Revelation 7, they don't see that as 12 literal tribes of Israel. They spiritualize it and they say, no, those are spiritual tribes. And that's referring to the 144,000, us Jehovah's Witnesses. What are you talking about? See, that spiritual application is the one that we avoid the most. Why? Because cults abuse it the most. This is a very, uh, this is the most famous and most abused interpretation from cults and false churches today is the spiritual. This is the one. So because of that, we avoid it. We get scared of it. <coughs> the Bible believers... We're all about right doctrine, right? That's why most of you are here, because you want the truth. You want the right doctrine, the truth. What's the truth? What's the truth? So then this is the most preferred for Bible believers. This is the one that we go ding, and then this one we avoid like the plague. Because of that, I believe that our... Less concentration on this application made us avoid what we could use to support the doctrinal and the historical and even the spiritual itself. I believe that this spiritual application, if it was more concentrated upon, this thing would be so powerful that it would contribute to... Here, here let me write this down. It would contribute more to understand the historical. It would become more powerful. It would emphasize more on the doctrinal, make it more powerful, and even itself, the spiritual. How? We'll come to that later on, all right? So that way it can be incredibly eye-opening to you. So I argue spiritual application, we should concentrate on this more, and I believe will be the most important. So that is just my opinion. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. However, there will be no doubt that what I'm right on is it's more important than what you thought before, okay? Yeah. That's what I will prove tonight. Now, first things first is that introduction, we know triple application. Now, dispensationalism, let's go over there, okay? In dispensationalism, what do we know? What we know about dispensationalism is this is the number one tool to find right doctrine. We agree with that, right? The number one tool. We know that has been incredibly helpful. So what is dispensationalism? Basically, dispensationalism, uh, it teaches that not every verse in the Bible applies to you. There are verses that can apply to different groups of people in different time periods. Understanding that, and we do know that certain verses, for example, James chapter 2, it mentions faith without works is dead. Uh, you are justified not by faith only, but by works. <laughs> that verse does not apply to us. But how many churches have abused that verse to say that you have to do faith and works for salvation? No, that is a complete wrong doctrine because... James chapter 1 and James chapter 5 points out that these are for the 12 tribes of Israel in the tribulation, the last days. So, faith and works for salvation then is for tribulation Jews, not for you. So, notice how dispensationalism solved it. Here's another false verse. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many cults have used that verse to point out that you have to get baptized for your salvation? However, the answer is simple, where we realize, and what we do know, is that Acts 2, 38 was for Jews during the times of the, before the church age, before the Christians, God was still dealing with the nation of Israel during the transitional period of Acts. So that baptism for salvation was for them. But then later on, Paul the apostle came to the scene and it switched from Jew to Gentile. 
And when Paul was preaching to the Gentiles, he didn't say water baptism for salvation. He says salvation by faith, not by works. Right. Now, God is no longer using the nation of Israel today. He's only doing it partially or he's doing it tempor uh, temporarily. But anyway, he's going to get back to them permanently. But the point is, is that we do know God the Holy Spirit is not moving to Jews to today. He temporarily cast them aside and went to Gentiles now, right? Yeah. For Jews to get saved, they need to go to Gentile missionaries. Gentiles are the one reaching out to them. So that's where we get our right doctrine from then, is from Paul's teachings to the Gentiles. That's where we get the idea of salvation by faith, not by works. Then every other verse in the Bible that talks about works for your salvation or water baptism, then we have to realize they could be at different time periods or to the Jews. So you have to keep that in mind. So that's dispensationalism, and that has been incredibly helpful. So the two main things within dispensationalism that you'll hear quite often from people is that dispensationalism, how they do their works, is uh, how, they, how it operates. They go by two things. You have to look at one, who is, it, who is the verse speaking to? And when, what time period it's in. By looking at verses in the Bible that way, it helps immensely. So James chapter 2, who is this speaking to? James 1, 12 tribes. What time period? James 5, last days, tribulation. Hence, faith and works for salvation in James 2 is for Jews in the tribulation. Acts 2, 38. Uh, baptism for salvation. Who is this speaking to? The three verses behind it and, in, and uh, surrounding it points out to the house of Israel. Uh, then what time period? It was at the time period of Acts before God turned to the Gentiles with the Apostle Paul through his gospel of salvation by faith. See, you get your answer that way. So dispensationalism is extremely crucial. Now, Here's the thing, how can you go to the right person and the right time period? Well, it's simple to do that by doing common sense. We look at historically what time period it is and what group of people. But see that common sense, when we keep looking that way at those verses, then what are you going to do, for example, with the book of Psalm? where historically at that time period, who the person is, what the time period is, is referring to David and the nation of Israel. But in the middle of that context, all of a sudden, it talks about Jesus. So if you look at it historically, that's not going to work. How do you get to Jesus then? Because historically, that's David, and that's the nation of Israel in the book of Psalm. How do you jump to Jesus? You can only jump to Jesus through the spiritual realm. Spiritually. See? So within the words of God, if we look at that as historical words rather than spiritual words, then you're not going to see Jesus in those verses. However, if God the Holy Spirit is a spirit and his words are spirit, and the spirit is not bound by time, and the spirit can go whichever person, whichever time period it wants to, God can say whatever he wants, so he can give like 10 verses, and the Holy Spirit can jump to any time period it wants to and talk to five groups of people if it wants to. Interesting theory. Do we have scriptural proofs? Shall we begin? All right. One by one now, all right? I've given now the foundations here. I argue that spiritually it would make more sense the historical and the doctrinal and the spiritual parts itself. And then I've also talked about how spiritual dispensation will help more with who, it speak, who the verse is speaking to and the time periods. The Holy Spirit can jump times, can jump people. All right, now, the best place to start is Hebrews 4 and Ephesians 6. 
Hebrews 4, and Ephesians 6. Let's first see how we can study this Bible. <coughs> how we study the Bible, and this is the problem with secular academic scholars, is that they take the historical approach. So they're, they're right about looking the verse and you know reading it as it says, by common sense, who, the, who is the verse speaking to and what time period. See, dispensationalism, it agrees with that historical point of view. That is just common sense. That's just reality. That is truth. However, if you stick to that historical point of view, that historical application, that historical mindset, how can you do that with the words of God? Is the words of God bound by history? Is the words of God historical words or spiritual words? All right, so Ephesians chapter 6. Notice right here, the Bible says in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the what? Spirit. Which is the what? So the word of God is spirit. That's right. If the word of God is spirit, your understanding has to be spiritual. Your application has to be spiritual. Your hermeneutical study has to be spiritual. Your perspective, your looking into it, your observation into it, your interpretation from it has to be spiritual. Go to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Not only that, the Bible even demands that the Word of God, when it's being applied to you, it's, a, it's applying to you spiritually. See, the spiritual application in my opinion, is the most important. And if you disagree, that's fine. You can at least agree it's more important than what you previously thought. It shouldn't be avoided. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick. That means it's alive. And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a what? Discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See that? That's spiritual. It's doing a spiritual operation. <clears throat> you have to understand that book spiritually. Go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. When Jesus spoke his words, it is very important, and Jesus even gave you the big clue and hint that you have to realize that the words he's giving to you that they are spirit, and that they must be spiritually understood. Look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and then verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, just like Hebrews 4.12, right? The word of God is quick. See, that's spiritual. That's all spiritual. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Okay, so you got to be careful of your physical understanding. His history is the history of man, history of physical flesh. See that? So if you try to understand that Bible through a humanistic perspective, through a fleshly perspective, through what current uh, unbelievers are doing, historical perspective, see that? See that? Then that's not going to work. John chapter 6, verse 63 continues, The words that I speak unto you, they are what? Spirit. And they are life. They are spirit. And they are life. Okay. The other one, I want you to turn to uh, uh, John chapter 4. John chapter 4. <coughs> Is this convincing enough that this book is to be spiritually understood? Can we agree with that much? That when we understand its words, we got to understand it spiritually. What does understand mean? Understand means how you're interpreting it, how you're viewing the verse, how you're making up ideas from the verse. That's understanding there. So how are you understanding those verses? 
How are we basing our arguments, our logic, our reason? How do we understand, believe? The, it's, it's spiritual. John chapter, and that is truth. That's not made up. That's not like Jehovah Witness. Look, anyone can make up uh, an interpretation from the verse. That's why unbelievers accuse the Christian. You can make up anything from the verse. Well, the reason why they accuse that is because Christians aren't the one doing, spouting that. It's nonsensical apostate churches and cults doing that. Because, yes, let's agree. If you say Revelation 7, that's referring to 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses. You made that up, man. But see, they call that spiritual interpretation. They call that spiritual 12 tribes of Israel in Revelation 7. See what the devil did? The devil destroyed this important method of interpretation through his spiritual application. To be honest, that's, uh, yeah, it's a spiritual application. I agree with that. But what kind of spiritual application? What kind of spirit's behind it? It's a biased spirit. It's an evil spirit. It's a cultic spirit. See that? So those words of God, yes, they are spiritually interpreted, but that doesn't mean it's all evil or negative. What that means is there is evil and good, so how are you going to interpret that? If the Holy Spirit is the ultimate interpreter and the guide, is your spirit going to conjoin with him as he's interpreting that verse to you, or is your spirit going to follow a different spirit? Okay, this is not made up like the Jehovah Witnesses when you spiritualize verses. No, this is truth. This is truth method. The evidence is John 4. Notice right here, John chapter 4, verse 24. So important, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in what? In spirit and in truth. See that? Spirit is in line with truth. If you're all about doctrine, doctrine is, uh, I think we can all agree, that simply means truth, okay? It's not cut off, right? Uh, well, anyway. Uh, so if you want to understand truth, how can you do that without the spiritual application, the spiritual aid? See that? That's why I believe this is going to be very important. Because it'll make the doctrine more clear. It'll make the historical application more clear and everything else. It's going to be incredibly eye-opening. Now that we realize that this is a truth method, this is a true interpretation, this is not made up by Gene Kim, this is scripturally proven, now let's look at a few cases. Let's graduate bit by bit. Go to uh, Matthew 23. Matthew 23. And I want you to go to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. <clears throat> All right, go to the book of Matthew. And I apologize, it wasn't 23, it was 22. And Psalm 110. Now, the psalm is what we struggle with. And the critics accuse that, oh, this is not referring to Jesus Christ the Messiah. This is referring to somebody else or some special entity or etc. It's not referring to Jesus. So we are going to look at Matthew 22. All right. So look at this, verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. Okay, so these are Jews, and they're trying to look at a historical perspective of the verse. The verse is Psalm 110, verse 1. All right, now keep your hand here, okay? We need to go back and forth, all right? Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Okay, they don't want to say that's referring to Jesus. The Jews are trying to look at a historical point of view and apply it, there's, ver there's various historical points of view. Some of them will try to say that's referring to a different type of uh, being or person. It's referring to uh, Melchizedek. Other people will say Israel or something like that, whatever. But 
for here in verse 42, the Pharisees view it as a literal son of David, okay, historically, sometime from David's line. But Jesus believes something is greater than that. Right. Now look at verse 43. He saith unto them, How then doth David what? Yeah. Wait a minute. Does that mean then that when you read the psalm next time, you have to look in the spiritual plane, in the spiritual point of view, not physical, not fleshly. Because the Pharisees, Sadducees were looking at a fleshly physical perspective here. This is referring to a literal humane son of David. But no, in the spirit, it's something more than that. In spirit, call him what? Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David call him Lord, how is he his son? Very good argument. That can't just be some kind of literal human son from David's line. Not just that. It's something more than that. He's deity, Lord. That's why verse 46, and no man was able to answer him a word. <laughs> Why? Because in the spiritual plane here, it's something different. Now, I want to make sure that this was archived, too. That way, they didn't miss yeah. out yeah. anything, I'm, any I'm word. It luckily, yeah. Okay, then. All right. This, I'm only doing this once in my lifetime. So, 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 so now, here, so what's going on? The point is, Psalm 110, verse 1, can't be read historically in a physical humane perspective. Matthew 22, we read from a humane, historical, literal perspective in Matthew 22 that Jesus said, hey, that verse in Psalm 110 should be taken, should be looked in in the spiritual realm. So there's no doubt about it. So this is convincing evidence that when you look at the Old Testament passages, you can't just look at it from a historical, physical, fleshly plane. You better look at it in a spiritual plane, too. Because this is referring to deity. So then, this makes a lot more sense when we go to Isaiah 53. So let's, so let's look at Isaiah 53. So let me give convincing arguments why you have to spiritualize verses. You can't just look at it from a historical perspective. That's what unbelievers are doing. That's why Orthodox Jews, rabbis, or different Jews, they have a difficult time seeing Christian doctrine in Old Testament verses, Christian beliefs in Old Testament verses. They think that we're making them up. No, that's not true. They're not being made up. Because we saw in Matthew 22 that Jesus said that this, this is a spiritual argument. And those rabbis, these are rabbis, learned doctors, they couldn't argue against that. How can God, uh, God uh, say to God, <laughs> and then uh, at the same time, he's David's son? There's only one explanation. There's only one answer. That has to be the Messiah. That has to be Jesus Christ, the Christian God. That's the only explanation. But how are you going to explain Isaiah 53? So Isaiah 53 is the famous passage we use for the crucifixion of Jesus. But if you were to look at it from a Jewish perspective, I mean, Jesus is not mentioned here. And, you know, if we look at Isaiah by context, if we go to Isaiah 50, all right, it's referring to Israel, they'll see it as, Isaiah 50. Now, let's look at verse 6. How do you and I see that? Isaiah 50, verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. Hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Now, to Christians, that's easy. We say Jesus, right? Nonchalantly. But you can't do that. You've got to be honest. Because look at, uh, if you look at the context right here, the context is referring to God's servant. When it's referring to God's servant, we look at verse 4. We look at verse uh, 10. See that? Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his what? Servant. This is referring to Israel, they'll argue, because of verse 1. See that? Verse 1 and verse 2. Israel, they force, the context is Israel forsook God, all right? So God, you know, he divorced them. 
But then later on, when you look at verse 4 through 11, God restores Israel. He restores the relationship. So then, because of this context, that's why Isaiah 53, when you go over there, it's natural to think this is referring to God's servant, Israel. That's what they'll argue. But there is a problem here. You might say, what's the problem? The problem is you can't really say that. There's no doubt that the Christian view has to be legit because what are you, uh, will, will the Jews dare say that they will dare claim verse 11 through 12? Is that not blasphemy? Look at 11 and 12. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Is that Israel his servant? By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. See, it says servant, so that's Israel. But look at this, the servant, what? Justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. How does Israel bear Israel's iniquities? See? <laughs> Verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressor, and he what? Bear, Bear the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Yeah. Would a Jew dare say, that's them? Who can forgive sins but God only? Mm, that's good. Mark 2, yeah. Jews realize that's blasphemy. That's good. Wow. Jews recognize that's blasphemy. Look at Mark 2. No, don't say it's the nation of Israel or the Jew. Mark chapter 2. That's more than that. That is a Christ. That is an intercessor. That is a Messiah who intervened, took the sins of people. That is referring to a Savior, one who saves his people from their sins. Jesus, that's the name you just don't want to say. All right, look at Mark chapter 2. Notice in verse... Uh, Seven, look, look what the Jews accuse Jesus. Mark 2, verse 7. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but what? Isaiah 53, Jesus can claim that because he is God. So he can forgive sins. Those Jews didn't like that. That's why they accused him of being blasphemy. Okay. Now, this makes a lot of sense, and there's no doubt. When you look at the Old Testament verses, th there's no way you can really apply that to Israel or to people. That's just a small sample. There's just verses that, go, that doesn't make sense. For example, when we look at Psalm 110 again, it says that you'll be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I mean, that, that don't make sense. But Hebrews argued that it's going on up in heaven. See, the spiritual realm. See, that makes sense. So uh, there, there's going to be a hard way of interpreting these verses if you keep insisting this is some kind of Jewish application historically from a long time ago. There's no doubt you have to what? Put the spiritual application there. That's evidence. The evidence is Matthew 22 we saw earlier. Jesus said, David said, in spirit. We saw other verses. The other verses says, Jesus said, my words, they are spirit. They are alive. The Bible says God is a spirit. If you're going to worship him, you must in spirit and in truth. Truth, doctrine is aligned. It has to be aligned. It cannot be separated. This is our problem. We separate them. It has to be aligned with truth itself. Spiritual application. All right, that's a small sample. But let's keep looking at more. 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. Look at verse 10 through 12. 10 through 12. <coughs> now, Peter argues that the salvation that the Old Testament prophets have searched diligently, they couldn't understand. 1 Peter 1.10. Of which salvation, that's our salvation, the Christian salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So the salvation by grace, that was coming to you. But when they prophesied about this, talk, meaning that it will happen in the future, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Did you see that? Did you see that there? Notice that the Spirit of Christ 
goes to a time period too. The Holy Spirit can apply to different time periods. That spiritual application is important to go to different time periods. See that? Let's keep reading. Dick signified when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you. So notice that this salvation that the Old Testament uh, prophets have prophesied was not for them, but to us. It was going to happen to us. Why was that able to operate? Jump ahead in the future to us. Because look at the key access here. With the what? Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Mm, there it is. Wow. That's why God can jump that salvation up to the future time period. Because of the Holy Spirit involved in that. Here's another one. Which things the angels desire to look into? Angels are what? Ministering spirits. If angels are going to understand the Bible, they know they have to look at it through a spiritual lens. And they, even they themselves, had a difficult time. Isn't that something? Why? Because this is God the Holy Spirit here. So if you don't have God the Holy Spirit as your interpreter here, if you don't have him as the basis for the spiritual application and interpretation, how easy it is to give wrong spiritual interpretations like the cults are doing. And that's the most famous interpretation amongst theologians and Christian churches today. The wrong type of spiritual applications. But if you have the Holy Ghost, it shouldn't be the least it shouldn't, be the, it shouldn't be the one that's most avoided or the least preferable interpretation. If you have the Holy Ghost, then this should be the most important, in my opinion, in my opinion. All right, that's not all. I got a lot more evidences. This is only scriptural. We didn't even go to academic or theological. Wait for those days when we come, all right? The most convincing, Ezekiel 28. Let's look at here. Ezekiel chapter 28. Here's an example why you cannot apply this passage to a historical person in his historical time period. Now look at dispensationalism working here, where you can get double application. Remember I mentioned that to you before? What does that mean? In other words, you can take a verse from the Bible, okay? So let's take this as a verse, all right? That way it'll be easier. So let's say uh, chapter 10. <laughs> Then here's verse 1, here's verse 2, here's verse 3. Now, what did I mention to you before about messianic prophecies, about the general epistles? When you look at the context of this verse, historically, uh, let me do a different color, that way it will be less confusing, okay? All right. Historically, when we look at it, it might be referring to the nation of Israel, right? It might be referring to those first century Christians that the general epistles authors were writing to, right? It could be referring to uh, what the Jews argued about the righteous servant. It could be referring to David, etc. <clears throat> so that's the historical, which we agree with. That is valid. But in the middle of it, right, which we saw before, in the middle, it could change. It could change where the middle, let me do blue, that way it's less confusing. Middle, it could be all of a sudden spiritual. So look at this. Dispensationalism mentions the time period and group of people. Absolutely correct. That's so important. And that's historical, right? That's very historical. Uh, person and time. We agree, right? The, these two things, that's very helpful. Can't the spiritual do the same as well? Obviously. Why? Because it should be more so. Why? Because, if, because the Holy Spirit is not bound by time. From God's perspective, he could see multiple things going at once. 
before uh, we go to Ezekiel 28, let me uh, put a bookmark here. Let me give an example, okay? So I forgot this verse. Go to Exodus, all right? This is the verse that I use for, to establish dispensationalism. Go to Exodus. This is very important. Tetragrammaton, right? Who God is? Go to Exodus chapter 3. Do we agree God is not bound by time? Yes. Yeah, nearly everyone, okay? I, even unbelievers know Christians believe in that, okay? So pretty much everyone can agree God is not bound by time. God is omnipresent. That means he's, he's always there no matter what time period. In other words, everything is present tense to him. He has no past tense or future tense. Why? Because uh, God, see this? Man is human. We're frail. We're bound by time. We all die. We all have a past. We all are bound by time periods. No, you can't jump time plane. Sorry, that's not how it's going to work. But God is not bound by that. God is everywhere, omnipresent. So God could be here, 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 there, there, all at once. Do you understand that? Now, do you see this? He can go to four different groups of people then, or four time periods at once. If he speaks, when he speaks, he could be speaking about three different time periods, three different groups of people. Why? Because he's God. This is, we're getting now to ontological arguments right here. And so we're going through even intellectual levels. This is indisputable indisputable when God speaks when he does something who he is he is I am that I am so when we look at Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 and God said unto Moses I am that I am and he said thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel I am has sent me unto you I mean a great example is the book of John Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. What did that mean? He pointed out he always is present, even though uh, we're talking about back in the past of Abraham. To Abraham, it's the past, but Jesus always is. God is always is. Okay, now, this makes a lot of sense. Every, pretty much everyone can agree so far that this will make sense. Now, do you understand why when we looked at Psalm earlier that it can go, it can jump different time periods, different groups of people. It can talk about Israel the servant, but then it can jump to Jesus the Messiah and back to Israel the servant. Now, here's, a, uh, here's another evidence that God talks this way. When he talks, you know, he doesn't put boundaries, you know, like, okay, this is that time period, that group of people, like that. No, he doesn't do that. He just talks everything at once. Why do humans have to divide the verses? We're bound by time. We're not I am that I am. We're not always is. So look at uh, Ezekiel 28. Let's see, Ezekiel 28. Now check this out. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came, unto, uh, came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Now, this is very easy. Can we agree that this is, who is the Lord speaking to? What time period is it in? It's in the past. God is speaking to a literal uh, Prince of Tyrus during the timeline when Tyrus, the kingdom of Ky Tyrus was still ongoing before its fall when Babylon uh, crushed it to pieces. All right? We can all agree with that. God is speaking to a human. Okay? We all agree. But look at this context here. Check this out, man. All right? See if God switches people and switches time period all of a sudden. Verse 3, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. Uh, maybe, okay? 
maybe Prince of Tyrus. But then it's kind of sound a little weird here, right? We're, we're thinking it might be a higher entity God is talking to. But let's keep reading. What are you going to do uh, when you read uh, verse 13? Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, no, lo, uh, no, what are you talking about? Every precious stone was thy covering. Uh, look at verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. All right, that's very plain. Okay, this ain't a regular prince of Tyrus now, okay? What's going on? We know that's Satan. That's pretty plain. This is Satan in the garden of God. Why? Because, and notice the time period has been jumped. It's no longer at the time period of the nation of Tyrus before Babylon destroyed it. Now it goes all the way back to the in the beginning, before Genesis 1. How about that? It talks about Satan's fall. So notice different groups of people and different time periods were jumped. How can God do that? Simple. You, know, you want the answer? This is so easy. God was speaking to the king of Tyrus historically during the nation, uh, during the kingdom of Tyrus before Babylon destroyed it. But he was also looking in the spirit of that king, uh, prince of Tyrus. And he saw Satan in there. And he was speaking to Satan too. What does that mean? That means when God's talking, when he's look, talking to a physical time period, listen, don't miss this out, all right? When he's speaking in a physical time period or to a physical person, he's seeing something else spiritually. And when he sees something else spiritually, that could be a different time period and a different person. Did that open up Pandora's box now to a lot of verses when you're going to read and study? I told you so. I didn't make this up. This is evidence right here from these verses. From these verses, this is very evident. If you were to read these verses, there is no doubt when God is speaking to someone historically, he's seeing something else in the spiritual plane. That is very convincing there. Now, the most easy one, if you're still not convinced, okay, the most easy one is Matthew, okay, 16. Go to Matthew 16. Here's the most easy one. Go to Matthew chapter 16, and then verse 23, all right? Who is Jesus speaking to? See? Well, he is speaking to flesh and blood Peter, all right? But no, Jesus saw something else in the spirit, and he was speaking to Satan. Look at Matthew 16, 23. But he turned and said unto, not Satan, unto who? Peter, get thee behind me, and he called him what? And you wonder why in the book of Psalm, God called one person uh, David, but then, or the, uh, excuse me, uh, in the Old Testament, when God talks about David, then, the, then it switches to a different identity of a person. Oh, that's made up. No, that ain't made up. This makes absolute perfect sense when you put that spiritual plane in there. That's a spiritual reality that physical scientists are trying to get into. See that? That's why they play with, uh, you know, theoret uh, theoretical physics and they get into that what CERN is doing, trying to find the beginning of beginnings, what's behind our current dimension, and see all that stuff? That's what mankind's trying to do. Why? Because there's a greater reality there compared to the smaller reality we live in. And you don't think that this greater reality, the spiritual plane, should not be abided upon, should not be used? Very, very important. So now we see the spiritual plane. It makes absolute sense. Exodus 3, God said, I am that I am, right? Don't forget John 4, God is a what? See that? If God is, I am that I am. He sees everything in his point of view, present tense. But he is also a spirit. That's why that spirit can access to any time period and put it as present tense. 
It can put it as, hey, I'm talking to this flesh and blood person, but I can be also talking about a different person too because I'm seeing something else in the spiritual realm. All right, here's extremely con uh, an extremely fun one. Go to Revelation 1 and 2. And I am past the time. I, I will, uh, I will, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. That way I can come into part two nicely, okay? All right. Revelation. Oh, it's so hard to understand the book of Revelation. A lot of, uh, there's a heresy called preterism, and they say all this stuff happened already in the past, in the first centuries. No, no, and no, okay? If you read Revelation 6, that didn't happen in the first century, okay? There were rocks falling out of the mountain, and then the kings, they were scared of Jesus coming down and being present to judge them. That didn't happen first century, okay? There's no doubt that's future time period tribulation, okay? But anyway, Revelation, look at this. The, the stumbling block is Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, all right? Notice who he's speaking to in Revelation 2, 1. Unto the angel of the church of what? Ephesus, right, okay. Ah, so historically he's speaking to a local church, all right? So, the church, that's us Christians. Verse 2, don't Christians apply that? I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Yeah, that's why we don't believe the charismatic healing movement. Because of verse 2, we Christians apply that. Oh, but we got a problem here. What are we going to do uh, when we look at uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7? Verse 7, he that the ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So he's speaking to literal churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. Whoopsie. I, I thought it's believing in Jesus Christ for your salvation. But here it says overcoming. So we know, and you've heard this before, this book is called Revelation. So Common sense, that's about end times here, okay? So this is tribulation doctrine. The problem, though, is he said churches at chapter 2, verse 1. So what's the solution? If God can speak to someone historically at their time period and see something else going on in the spiritual realm at a different person, different time period, why can't he do that with Revelation 2? You want the answer? He, historically, he was speaking to local, actual churches at that time, but in the spirit, he saw those tribulation saints where they're going to have to overcome and work for their salvation. That's why there's a mingling of the text of Christian church doctrine with tribulation doctrine. And you don't think this spiritual application is important. Now, do you want evidence that there's a spiritual basis for this? <laughs> Verse 1 already told you the answer. Unto the who? Yeah. Unto the who? Angel. Not church of Ephesus. Angel of the church. Right. You want more evidence? Look at uh, John when he's speaking in verse 10. Revelation 1.10. Revelation 1.10. I was what? In the On the what? The oh, this, this is a totally different time period here. He's in a spiritual plane. He's speaking in the spirit. You want more evidence? I'll t look at this one. Uh, look at uh, verse 20. Verse 20. Revelation 1.20. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Okay. These seven candlesticks are the seven churches. But hey now, look at this. Look at this. When you jump down to Revelation chapter, uh, let's see. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the what? Okay, look at this. Seven spirits sent forth into all the earth. 
Why are there seven spirits? Where did they come from? Did you read the context? Chapter 2 and 3 are seven churches. And what did God say to each church? Hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Church of Ephesus. Church of Smyrna. Hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Church of Thyatira. Hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Church of uh, Pergamos. Hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Same thing with Sardis. Same thing with uh, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Why do you think there are seven spirits? Seven candlesticks are the seven churches. It's not literally seven. Seven churches are not literally seven candlesticks, but spiritually they are that candlestick that the Holy Spirit, if he's that oil and that light, it makes sense. So there's a spiritual wording interpretation plane that's being conjoined with that historical churches that time. We just scratched the surface. Wait till we get into the academic and theological. All right. That should be more than convincing evidence that, this, that there, these are scriptural proofs for spiritual application and that helps contribute immensely toward dispensational teaching and double application with general epistles, messianic prophecies, etc. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers, opened our eyes to the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.